Okay. So welcome everyone to the Animals and Society Colloquium Series, September Colloquium. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Caitlin Scrano, um, and her talk is Using Poetry to Learn from the Animals We Brought to Antarctica. Before I introduce Caitlin and um, really begin with what, what you all came here for, I want to let you know a little bit about the Animals and Society Colloquium Series. It is hosted as a joint project between the Animals and Society section of the American Sociological Association. Um, I am a member of that group and um, ASI, the Animals and Society Institute. Um, if you are a sociologist, I really hope that you would consider joining um, ASA and joining our section. Um, but anybody, academic, non-academic, and no matter what discipline you're from, um, would benefit from signing up from the ASI newsletter and being a part of ASI. So with that, I want to hand it over to uh, Gayla Argent to tell you a little bit about ASI. Yes, hi. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I'm the Human Animal Studies Program Director with ASI, and for those of you who might not know what we do, um, we, my job is to further the field of human animal studies, that, and that concerns with um, human animal relationships. So we, as an association, manage two academic journals and a book series on human animal studies. We've got a bunch of resources for scholars, researchers, faculty, and mental health professionals on the website. And I will put the link in the chat when I'm done talking. Um, I also produce a monthly human animal studies um, email that goes out. It's a, a, you can join the listserv. And one of the resources that we're working on right now, and it's in beta that I'm gonna release is a database of all of the programs, um, uh, minors, majors, bachelors, masters, and PhDs for, um, in, for the academic study of human animal studies. So if you sign up for this human animal studies report, I'll give you the link, um, you'll get to be in on the beta launch of that. The report also has news, um, funding opportunities, calls for papers, um, calls for papers for journals, calls for papers for books, calls for papers for um, conferences. So it's a it's a valuable resource, but I hope you check out um, the main website and see what you can find that might help you. Thank you so much. And I can um, vouch that this is a very useful newsletter to sign up for. It's a lot of great information and opportunities. All right, so without further ado, let's get to our talk today. I am really excited to introduce Dr. Caitlin Scrano. She's a writer based in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, she holds a PhD and an MFA in poetry. Her second full-length collection of poems, The Necessity of Wildfire, was selected as the winner of the Wren Poetry, po poetry Prize and won a 2023 Pacific Northwest Book Award. Dr. Scarano is a member of the Washington Wolf Advisory Group and spent November 2018 in McMurdo Station. I'm sure if I pronounce that wrong, we will learn that soon in this presentation in Antarctica. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Scarano. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna thank Carol and Lisa and Gayla uh, for coordinating. And I wanna thank all of you in the audience today for taking time out of your day to join us. So. Yeah, the talk is using poetry to learn from the animals we brought to Antarctica. Um, let's see. Okay, so a bit more about me. Um, my name is Caitlin Scarano. I'm based in Bellingham, Washington. I live in a tiny house there with my two dogs, Vic and Peach, you can see on the screen. I have a PhD and an MFA in poetry, um, two full length collections, Do Not Bring Him Water and The Necessity of Wildfire. And I currently work outside of academia in uh, learning and development for an educational technology company. And I teach creative writing courses on the side, primarily through writers.com. As far as the impetus for this project, I was a participant with the Antarctic Artist and Writers Program and spent November, 2018 in McMurdo, uh, Antarctica. 
I was also a participant in the ASI and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Human Animal Studies Summer Institute back in July 2021. Uh, and yes, I am a member of the Washington Wolf Advisory Group. We give uh, recommendations regarding wolf policy to the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I will be, I'll be reading from a separate screen, so I will turn uh, to the side a bit. Um, as far as my interest and involvement with human animal studies, it's been mainly self-taught and self-directed. I write about animals often in my poetry, and I've taken and taught courses on writing about animals. I have also worked with a visual artist and wildlife biologist. Her name is Megan Para. Um, we've done some collaborative projects, so my poetry and her visual art on the wolves in Denali National Park and a different exhibit on the ecology and migration of the porcupine caribou herd in Alaska. I also have a chapter, um, which is on the same project that I'm presenting on today, forthcoming in the anthology Poetry in the Global Climate Crisis. This anthology demonstrates how humans become sensitized to and intervene in environmental degradation by reading, writing, analyzing, and teaching poetry. Um, I do want to give a, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I will discuss violence done to animals today, violence done to animals involved during the Antarctic explorations. And there are a few photos of a dog skeleton. So please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself in regards to these topics. So why Antarctica and why the dogs? When I lived in Alaska, I became particularly interested in the ecologies, cultures, and histories of the circumpolar regions. Honestly, if I if I go back, like I've been like obsessed with the circumpolar regions since I was a child. Um, I learned when I was living in Alaska, I learned about the Antarctic Artist and Writers Program, and I submitted a proposal to write poems about the intersections between humanity and landscape in Antarctica, and that proposal was accepted. So I found the primary focus for that proposal, that project, when I was in uh, Christchurch and visited the Canterbury Museum there, which is the Natural History Museum. I'm going to get to that momentarily, but I just want to give some context first. So Antarctica was first sighted in January 1820 during the heroic age of exploration, Antarctic exploration. So this is roughly the late 1800s to about 1917. 10 countries launched a total of 17 major Antarctic expeditions. The majority of these were from the United Kingdom. Almost as soon as human beings began exploring the continent, they brought other animals with them, mainly quote unquote beasts of burden. So ponies, mules, dogs, a few cows, and there was even a cat. Um, I want to also note that the colonization of Antarctica was distinctly masculine. So the history of dogs in Antarctica is often a story of men. The first woman to step foot on the continent, her name was Caroline Mickelson, the wife of a Norwegian whaler, didn't do so until 1935. And during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, none of the 17 expeditions included women. The prevailing attitude was that women could not handle the harsh conditions and of the continent. And women didn't actually enter McMurdo Station, which is the one of two U.S. bases, the primary U.S. base there. Women didn't enter McMurdo Station until 1957. So the reason I point this out is because I'm interested in the impact of masculine exploration on women non-human beings and landscape. And so this is an intersectional topic and project and that is how I'm gonna talk about it today. So the day before I flew to Christ, flew from Christchurch to McMurdo, I had some time to kill and I went to the Canterbury Museum and came across this exhibit called Dogs in Antarctica. This exhibit was distinctly family friendly there were children all around, and it included stories and artifacts such as journal entries, photos, film footage, and material objects like harnesses, whips, and collars. I was struck by how the meticulousness and sentimental tone of the curation sort of juxtaposed with an undercurrent of violence that was hinted at but left largely unaddressed. The exhibit framed the dogs as consenting heroes and fellow explorers. Yet, as I would discover in my years long archival research journey that began that day in the museum, uh, much of what humans did to the dogs brought to Antarctica was strange and disastrous. So there were dogs shoved from airplanes by the US Navy to test parachutes, 
whole dog teams and sleds disappearing into crevasses of ice hundreds of feet deep, dogs marching until their hearts gave out, dogs starving alongside humans, dogs tied to ship decks in years of wind and rain, dogs that had dead penguins tied to their collars to discourage them from wiping out whole sections of rookeries, um, dogs that watched from their chains as men left them in abandoned bases, um, there were puppies shot, there were dogs fed to other dogs, and dogs eaten by humans. And this is just a fraction of like some of the stuff that happened. Um, often when I'm grappling with something particularly heavy or complex, I turn to poetry. Um, so I started to write about the animals we took to Antarctica, mainly the dogs, and the stories of what I was encumbering in my research. I've written about a chapbook worth of poems in a manuscript titles, titled Dogs of a Never-Ending Winter which takes a historical and archival approach to examining the impacts of colonialism and exploration in Antarctica on non-human beings, specifically the domestic animals we brought to the continent. So today I wanna read and look closely at three specific poems in this project. Um, the time frame covered in these poems I wrote ranges from the 19th century when humans first landed in Antarctica through the early 1900s when all non-native species except humans were banned from the continent via the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, otherwise known as the Madrid Protocol, which was signed in 1991 and entered into force by in 1998. So there are no longer any non-native species in Antarctica except humans. Um, each poem in the project draws from and engages with a different account involving human and animal interactions in Antarctic history, and I will try to show how I employ poetry to story the relationships between human and animals, as well as the complex network of relationships between human and animals and technology in the Antarctic landscape. So, so far I've discussed the dogs in Antarctica generally, but part of the transformative power of developing a post-humanist ethic derives from the radical care, questioning, and imagined futures that emerge when we give attention to individual lives and the agency of specific non-human beings. Uh, for expedition bases, so these are like huts that are still standing, during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration remain intact near McMurdo around the Ross Sea region of Antarctica. Through the archival research I conducted in McMurdo, I learned there was a dog carcass still near Cape Evans. So this dog was left behind, still chained up with a leather collar around its neck outside of Scott's hut, which is also known as the Terra Nova hut. And it was left behind sometime during the heroic age. So that's late 1800s to roughly 1922. This particular dog, both anonymous and tangible, is often photographed. And this is a photograph that I took of the dog. So its phases of mummification and decomposition are publicly chronicled. You can Google it and find other um, images. While in Antarctica, I had the privilege of visiting these historic huts and seeing the dog. Um, and these huts are currently maintained by the Antarctic Heritage Trust, which is a New Zealand nonprofit whose mission is to conserve, share, and encourage the spirit of exploration. And it's not just this dog's body that's still in these huts. They left behind um, like many things, their clothing and news, like newspapers, their, their bedding, their like cans of food. So all this stuff is still there and has been like set up in a way or staged in a way that it might've actually been like in the huts um, preserved by the Antarctic Heritage Trust. So meeting this dog, um, which you see in the image there, or what remains of this dog and interacting with its materiality and the idea of it was a, really a catalyst that kind of like kicked this project off for me. Um, and I'm gonna read the poem and provide it here in its entirety. It's called Cape Evans Dog. Inside the pony stalls of the historic hut, I find what I came for, a dog or what remains of it preserved in decay. The room reeks of century old sealed blubber, hay and rot, there are photographs of this dog from the 1950s, but these days the dog is still attached, but mostly a pile. What is gone and what is here, this is what I catalog. Eyes gone, the so sockets are deep and void, though not without expression. Tongue gone, I imagine a human hand, a man's hand, the last one it might have nervously licked. But the teeth, most of the teeth remain, fitting closely together by design. The mouth, remnant of maw, softly closed, the jaw intact, shoulder blade and ribs intact, vertebrae just connected halfway down what would have been the back. I went to take one of those ribs for myself, 
possession always a human undercurrent. The right foreleg bone seems jumbled out of place as if placed too high by the neck. Does any flesh remain? It's hard to say. Some patches of fur here on cracked high, gray as dryer lint. This might have been a black dog. But now the skull is so bright, yellow white. He sleeps on bits of hay, a collar still around the bones of his neck, a chain still attached to the collar to keep him home, even after every man he knew is gone. Was he one of Shackleton's dogs? Did he get left behind, shot? What was his name? His pelvis, so small, delicate architecture, curve of sockets seems to crawl away. There's so much we cannot, we can never put back together, so many holes in all of these stories. So even in the Antarctic, even in the Antarctic environment, which serves as like somewhat of a freezer for all the stuff that's left behind, the dog is decomposing, albeit slowly. There's less dog now than, than in photographs of it from the 1950s or even the 1990s. So my poetic impulse here is to catalog the pieces that remain before it's fully gone and forgotten. And in their assemblage, try to like imagine piece together moments of this dog's life. Um, Closely observing and cataloging is something I do a lot in the poems of this project. I think it's trying to, a way of trying to account for what was, but it's hard to know. In the context of this poem, the poet and the speaker are one. So that's myself. I am the poet and the speaker. Um, yet there's distance here. The speaker does not address the dog, but refers to it. Um, this stems from the cognitive dissonance of possession. I feel close to this being or thing or the idea of what it was while alive. Therefore, I want to claim it or take part of it. Um, these sentiments usually projected onto a landscape are echoed in chronicles and justification of conquest and exploration. Like, I love this thing. I feel connected to it. So I'm it's mine. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to use it. Um, the dog, in a way, is the landscape which was acted upon. And the viewer or the reader or myself, the speaker, is the explorer, the actor, However, I would like to point out that the dog, like the landscape, is never without agency, though we may try to control, diminish, or dismiss that agency. I am changed by this dog. It acted upon me. I imagine and create for my encounter with its remains. The actual dog was an individual being that was brought to and abandoned in this landscape. It exists in this landscape today in an altered form. In the conclusion of the poem, I wonder about the dog's history and return to a desire to name in order to know it. In the first stanza of the concluding section, the speaker is closer to the dog, now imagined as he, instead of referred to as it. The speaker cannot know the answers to the questions they raise. Did he get left behind, shot, what was his name? And I did research this, I couldn't find the exact account of what happened to this dog. Um, but there's empathy in simply bringing attention to this dog, what it was and what it might have been. Yet the dog resists the speaker, seems to crawl away as the poem evolves into a reflection on the fragmentary and selective nature of human history and the intractability of acting upon. Despite my attention to this dog in retrospect, it still died because humans left it there. I experienced inner conflict at the unavoidable anthropomorphic aspect of the project. A human writing poems about these animals in some ways attempting to quote unquote give voice to them. It is challenging, paradoxical even, to account for the actual experience of animals in Antarctica due to the distance of time and space, but also the inherent unknowability of the non-human beings we share the planet with. As Carrie Wheel explains, there is another consciousness there, a consciousness we desperately desire to know through language, but that may remain impenetrable. So acknowledging the risk of anthropomorphism through poetic techniques and historical research, I believe it is possible and worthwhile to at least imagine this space. One approach to imagining animals is what Kenneth Shapiro refers to as the animal turn within the animal turn, which shifts from a too exclusive focus on the social construction of other animals to attempts to get at animals as such. So animals as they actually experience the world while giving due weight to the degree that our social constructions actually inform that experience. So one of the poems, Taro Tajiro, focuses primarily on the harrowing experience of two dogs, and the men are pushed to the periphery of the poem. And I, I will say, this story is one of the most incredible things I've ever heard. In February 1958, the members of the Japanese research station, uh, research expedition at Showa Station, 
Antarctica had to make an emergency evacuation. Um, so this team that was there at the station over the winter, they left 15 sled dogs chained up outside with a week's supply of food, thinking the incoming team would reach the dogs soon. But the incoming team's ship was trapped in ice and rescued by American icebreaker. So technically, no one returned to show a station for 11 months, and they had left these 15 dogs chained there with a week of food. Um, when the researchers finally did return in January 1959, so this is 11 months later, they found two of the dogs, uh, brothers Taro and Jiro, who are pictured here, and I think this picture is from the day that they returned and found the dogs. So two of the dogs had gotten out of their chains and were still there and had survived the 11 months. In Taro to Jiro, the poem, one dog speaks to another, his brother, after they've survived alone in Antarctica for nearly a year. Um, through questions and sensory details, I try to bring language to the suffering and confusion they might have experienced. I'm going to read the poem, but not display it just due to its length. So Taro to Jiro, one. A storm came up, the men packed, frenzied. We watched from gravity-dense chains where they left us tied. They gave us a few days worth of meat. It smelled of their fear. The raw chuff of the waiting chopper, all the men left, we watched. Show a station evacuated of human sound. There was no one there to say our names. Two, 15 heavy sacklin husky heads hung low in the wind, ever the wind, her mindless scraping. Brother, I am sorry for the wind and our hunger stretched hours. We waited, of course we waited. We were not good, not bad, not loyal. We had no other choice. Three. Some laid down, some broke spree, never seen again. Some did not get up. Brother, there's so much blue, fur so black it is blue, blue ice, blue sky, gray water roiling. The blue touches everything, only the two of us. Wherever you stand is the center of the earth. Between stars and snow, a spiraling current. Brother, somehow we got out of those chains, still the tangled mess of history. What did I know in those days? What comprised them? The unyielding smell of rock, hint of fish, your feces I chewed and rechewed, a howl for the sake of sound. No one answered us. Somehow we found food, movement, dragging baby seals away from the mother, chasing down penguins, catching fish trapped in ice. The details are murky because we do not tell our own stories. Men have mapped this coast, partitioned and named its features, East Ungol Island, Chachamachi Point, or Stand and Wait Point, waiting like a body turned inside out, waiting like a body in ice, unable to decompose, waiting became a house that refused to burn down. Deeper in, away from this wretched coast, all lines converge, 11 months past. Four. And then there was a day when we were not alone. Brother, we heard the men before we saw them. Your eyes startled with recognition. We watched them with patient caution from a hill near the station. Did we stand like race against the snow? Did the humans think they were dreaming? We were bred to survive. Karafuto Ken, now extinct, but that winter you and I did survive. We were found, loved, honored, finally fed. Brother, we were put back to work. So this is the actual photo I think I mentioned of Taro and Jiro. And I also want to say there's an excellent 1983 film about them called Antarctica. And I think it's available for free online. Um, you can't see it, but I wrote this poem in the couplet form. So those are two line stanzas. And the couplet form of the poem mirrors the intimacy and isolation of the two black dogs alone against the white landscape. I felt very compelled by this story trying to imagine how they survived, what the landscape and isolation was like for them, how they relied on each other as a pack of two and like that kinship there and how surreal it must have been, however dog experiences the surreal, um, when the humans returned. The poem ends with the return of the Japanese researchers, but the perspective of the poem stays with the dog. In these stanzas, the reader considers the men through the gaze of the dogs who wonder at what the men may have wondered. I also want to note what happened to Taro and Jiro after, and here I'm quoting from the Dogs in History blog. Taro and Jiro stayed in Antarctica to pull sleds for another ex for the new expedition. 
In 1960, Jiro died of a disease in Antarctica, and in 1961, Taro returned to his home and lived at Hokkaido University until he died of old age in 1970. Taro's body was embalmed and is on display at the Museum of National Treasures at the Botanical Garden of, of Hokkaido University, and Jiro's body was embalmed and is on display at the National Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo. So I tackle the question of anthropomorphizing more directly in the manuscript's final poem, which is called A Dog Speaks. By the 1960s, with the introduction of snow machines, airplanes, and other motor motorized vehicles, which were known as tin dogs, the sled dogs were viewed as no longer necessary. Because of the Madrid Protocol, so that's the environmental protocol, the last dogs were removed from Antarctica in February 1994. So in A Dog Speaks, I try to embody through the perspective of one of the last dogs on the continent, the complexity of the end of this era, as well as the potential richness of the dog's lives there. So after all, most of these dogs were different types of huskies. They were bred to haul, thrive in winter, um, like harsh winter conditions. And so certainly suffering, kinship, and pleasure are meshed here. Um, so here's the poem in its entirety, which I will also read. A dog speaks. And if I had to do it again, night, howl, ice, all stretching, all extending, yes, I would still be what I was made to be. If I had to do it again, I would still be beast. I would sing from gangline, scoop snow with my mouth as we run, the star spiraled sky, slow, sweet erosion of cartilage, pad, cartilage pads in my hips. If I had to, I'd still try not to tangle, fall, freeze. I try not to disappoint. Back to sledge bound, back to the driving white, landscape silence enveloping our working bodies. He said, pull. He said, whoa, haul, gee. Pleasure spotted my days, his hand below my chin. He said, hike. He said my name. If I had to do it again, I could smell blood on the ice, eat the hunks of seal meat from a freshly opened body, blubber and skin, pemmican and blocks of butter, collared and heavy letter, leather, a box to sleep in, some hay, pace at the end of my chain, this silver moon path worn in and reburied by snow again and again, his voice every bright or ink dark, ink dark morning. We had a purpose, even if it was their purpose. In dreams, years later, I run, bark below my breath, twitch at the memory of all that weight always behind me. So the binary of animals and technology in Antarctica, as well as the idea that the dogs were suddenly and simply replaced by different transportation technologies is inaccurate. These three forces, humans, non-human animals, and technology, um, are very much entangled, compromising what Donna Haraway refers to as an interweaving triad. Dogs help establish the human habitation in Antarctica. As Francis Spufford describes in his introduction to the Ends of the Earth, an anthology of the finest writing on the Arctic and Antarctic, this barbarous beginning is the foundation of the human sense we've made of the continent. And this barbarous beginning is also the foundation to the scientific advances and discoveries, including the discovery of the hole in the ozone that enables the National Science Foundation to secure taxpayer funding in order to send artists and writers to Antarctica. So I was and remain conflicted about my own presence there in 2018. It is the only place on earth without indigenous human inhabitants. We cannot survive the environment without extensive interventions. So the research bases are basically small diesel cities. As Michael Lucibella explains, each season, more than 450,000 gallons of fuel is either flown in by ski-equipped ski LC-130s or delivered by the South Pole Traverse, which is are these fleets of tractors that haul um, together, haul in more than a thousand, across a thousand miles from McMurdo Station to the South Pole. They sort of haul these huge bladders of fuel. Um, once it arrives, the fuel operators, or fuelies as they're known, unload and distribute the nation, the station's lifeblood. Just about everything there runs on fuel in one way or another. And the Antarctic landscape is changing. Uh, microplastics are present in freshly fallen snow now. The ever-expanding Antarctic tourism industrial complex continues to take a toll on the landscape's flora and fauna. 
weather in Antarctica grows increasingly extreme, greenhouse gases continue to rise um, through the Antarctic Treaty System. So the continent is governed by a treaty. Um, the continent is currently owned by no nation uh, and protected from mineral explo exploitation and conflict and understood as a place dedicated to peace and science. But the treaty becomes modifiable in 2048 as geopolitical tensions worsen, particularly between the United States, China, and Russia, will these nations honor the treaty? As energy reserves and fishing resources dry up elsewhere, will nations turn to the Antarctic region? I, I often wonder what will happen to Antarctica. And human animal studies and poetry can help us make decisions to live differently and imagine different futures. And I think imagining different futures is a first tentative step toward their realization. And really with this, with these poems, I'm like, I think a lot about looking back to look forward, specifically looking back at what happened to these animals to really consider how are we going to conduct ourselves there in the future. Um, a few months after I returned to the United States, after my time on the ice, I read a, patch, a passage in the Methow Naturalist. It says, we have to conclude that the world isn't supposed to be like anything in particular. It is always changing. The evolution of species and ecosystems goes on constantly, always adapt adapting to the interplay of other species changing the environment. Species and ecosystems are defined by a continuous process, not a fixed state. And you know, risking sentimentality. I believe Antarctica is the most dynamic environment I've ever encountered, and our continued human presence there is all but certain. Um, in reflecting on how we got there and all this violence done um, to non-human animal, non animals, to the landscape, I think the central question of our time remains is in what ways will we choose to be in relation? And so that's the conclusion of my talk, but I did want to share a few more photos here. So these are these are not photos I took. Um, these first two are of the Cape Evans dog. Um, this one is, I think, from the 1990s. And you can see the dog used to be outside and then they had moved the skeleton inside when I encountered him into this, the pony stalls. Um, this photo, I think, is from the 1960s. And I think this is um, a member of the US Navy holding the dog there. Um, and you can see how much more like composed or like put together the dog used to be. Um, these these images I just found striking for um, like seeing the dogs in the in and against the landscape. And this is the this these stalls you can see is where the um, where the ponies were housed. I didn't have time to talk about the ponies, but there's like a lot of really wild uh, stories about them. And I've written poems about, I wrote a poem about the day the ponies were like encountered the orcas that were down there when the sea ice broke up and they were hunted by orcas. Um, but anyway, in, in the stall is where they used to keep the ponies. So this is the room where these stalls are, where I went, it's attached to one of the huts. And this is where the Cape Evans dog skeleton is, where the, not far from where these actual, these dogs are sleeping. Um, yeah, this is a Navy plane. They're unloading or loading up the dogs. Um, here, a dog eating what I think is seal meat. And a puppy that was probably born, bred and born there. Okay, so I appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to open it up to questions. I'm going to try my best to keep my eyes on um, the full slate of people who we have here. Um, Caitlin, I don't know if you want to um, unshare your screen. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, I can, uh, you can use the hand raise thing and I can just try to call on people in order and then it will be up to you whether you would want to put yourself on camera or just unmute yourself. You could also put any questions or comments you have in the chat and I'll be moderating that. And so I'll do my best to get those um, those comments and questions brought up as well. So is there anybody who has a question and would like to start? Okay, I want to give people a little bit of time in case anybody is typing. Um, 
Caitlin, I'm wondering for you, um, this is a little bit um, disciplinary rather than focused on your specific talk, but how do you feel um, being a poet and a creative writer that um, the animal turn within the animal turn is handled in your field? Do you feel that there's a lot of space for the work that you're doing? You know, I think that um, I've encountered a lot of poetry about animals. What I have not encountered are a lot of creative writers actively having conversations about human animal studies um, and animal rights and animal activism. I certainly believe that those conversations are happening and like creative writers do um, identify as animal activists or like think about the agency of animals, but it's, I don't, I haven't encountered a lot of places where the fields are really like actively interacting and like these conversations are happening. So it's, it's a little, it's kind of like being in two different worlds. Like I was, I had an interest, I've always been interested in animals and sort of discovered human animal studies when I was working on my PhD in poetry. And I wanted to study it as like a, like a subtopic for my comprehensive exams. But my thesis advisor was like, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't want you to do that, you know? Cause it, so it was like, um, interesting how hard it was to sort of like bring like like within academia like bring human animal studies and and my poetry like actively together because I think people don't understand necessarily what it is or what it means but um there is work being done like there are um I can't remember the name of the press off the top of my head but I know that there's like a a press that specializes in like animal literature and they also offer a course on like the like the ethics of writing animals so um your question was about my own work you know I've, I've written about it's interesting how we can write and not be aware of what we're doing I think it was at some point when I was working on my MFA that somebody was like oh yeah all the animals in your poems and I was like oh like animals in my poems and I hadn't realized like there's animal imagery or animal metaphor in most of my poetry and I was like just doing it like like automatically right um but I still write about animals but I I try to approach it differently like not do it subconsciously because there's a difference in like use using an animal in a poem to have like an emotional effect or actually trying to engage with like the agency or the the consciousness the experience of that animal in poetry and so it's like it can can sort of it's probably on a spectrum like you can reference like you use an animal as a symbol as a reference as a thing in a poem but you can also have a poem that tries to be about the animal or embodies the animal right I think that your last comment um is echoed by um by a comment that um Annika put in here which is um oh no Isabel Isabella put in here which is that your interest in human animal studies is evident in the way that dogs are subject, not object in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and she wanted to note that she really respects it. Um, Annika states, um, so your poem Taro and Jiro is from the perspective of the dogs. How do you personally try to imagine the world through the dog's eyes and have you studied non-human animal behavior to help you with this? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, an animal biologist or wildlife biologist although I, I certainly think like that sh sometimes I think that was should have been my calling um but I really tried to approach that poem like most or not all the poems in this project it was it was through deep deep research on that actual account and it's been it's been five years since I was there since I started the research and I worked on it for a few years but I I had I've had trouble placing the poems like finding a publisher that's interested in such a niche poetic project um so I kind of just like had let the poem sit and um in doing this talk I was re going through my files and it's just like there was so much archival material like they're like most of the expeditions um had someone who at least one person who was keeping a diary or a journal so you can find those there's books on those there's even like um, there's photographs and even some video footage from back then. So this doesn't apply to Taro and Jiro, but with them, yeah, I read it. I just like tried to read extensively about what happened and sort of like cross check. Um, since, you know, so much time has passed, a lot of these are like 
not necessarily firsthand accounts that I'm encountering. So I'm trying to like cross check, like what I'm reading about what happened to these dogs. Like, did it actually happen? What do the different sources say? Do they confirm each other? Where are the gaps? And then how can I sort of represent what seems likely to have happened? You know, the dogs were there. They did survive. Um, they did stay there another year and work. They are embalmed in these museums in Japan now. Um, so like represent what actually happened. And then in the areas where it's less grounded, how can I represent like this is what's imagined. And I think I do try to do that through um, through the voice of the, of the dog, but also like um, by the use of questions. Right. And like weighing in on some commentary, like Taro and Jiro spent a year there alone. No one knows what happened, you know, like so I was reading like theory on like, like, how did these dogs survive? There's. Um, at least two of the accounts that I read, like say that the dogs didn't eat, like cannibalize the other dead dogs that were there. So they had to find other sources of food. So there's just like historians who posit, like this is likely what they ate and how they survived. Um, but it it is, um, it's like deeply fascinating. Like, I think that's part of the point of poetry. It's like, there here's this year that these two dogs, these two beings experienced and they did survive and no one can know, but like, let's just like dwell in that and try to like try to begin to think about like what happened what did they experience what did they see smell here right thank you um do we have any questions in the audience if one more in the chat but if anyone in the audience wanted to speak i wanted to give you a chance here i'll, I'll ask a question uh, hi, it's Melissa Tender. Hi, Caitlin. That was fantastic. I loved it. Thank you so much. Um, former academic, now full-time professional activist, because I was too activist for academia in, in the English department I was in. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm curious. So this morning I was uh, flipping through the New York Times online and there's a front page article about animal communication and language and um, you know, new research showing that, you know, surprise, surprise, like animals have language, they've used it for a long time, and we're learning more and more about animal, non-human animal language and consciousness all the time, and it seems like with increasing speed, we're making discoveries around that, and I'm curious if you follow any of that research, and what, if any, um, intersection or impact that those sorts of new findings have on on your poetic work or the work of poets in general. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I be very I don't follow that research actively. So if you have something specific in mind, I would be very intrigued to see it. I I think about um, like it's I know that animals have their own like language or their communication. Like on any like any species you're looking at, like to like I think it's a great human assumption to think like oh like just because they don't speak in like the way we understand speaking or communicating or our language like there is this this doesn't exist. Like I think all these animals have their own subcultures, and I think like one of the easiest when I when I think about animals communicating and their own cult and having their own cultures, I often think of of whales in particular, like the southern resident orcas here. It's you know they're they're megafauna, so it's like they're they're more flashy. I think like people are like very attached to the megafauna, but it is a good example. It's like these these whales like they pass down like. I have done some research on whales. I'm like also very fascinated by them, right? Like the way in which they they pass down these certain um, like certain sounds or songs that get repeated only across like family lines. And then some of them are like repeated within that pod, but then they're related to some of the sounds and songs that are like um, in in the, the like the related pod. So it'll be like like intermediate family sounds and songs and then like like the extended family sounds and songs, but very distinct from like a different subspecies of the resident of the killer whales. Um, Denise, I don't know if you feel comfortable um, talking. Um, I see your question in the chat. I'm just not sure exactly what you're asking. Denise's question in the chat is um, I'm interested in the dog human bond. Where can I study that? Denise, I wasn't sure if you meant in terms of poetry or more broadly more broadly um okay um i don't know that if you are feel prepared to answer that in in general caitlin um i know that asi has a lot of great resources that can help you figure out um where to go to study the dog human bonds caitlin i don't know if you have anything to add in terms of specifically 
um, in terms of the work that you're doing, where you've well, gone? To learn yeah, I mean, like these, some of these questions, I feel like it was like, I need, I need an animal behavioralist or biologist here with me to help like bring that side of this, you know, but uh, yeah, I would point you to ASI resources for sure. There's another text. I haven't had a chance to read it. So like, take this with a grain of salt. Um, it's called, uh, oh, made for each other, the biology of the human animal bond. I, somebody else recommended this to me, but again, I'm not 100% sure of like the quality of this text, but that is one that I have um, on my radar. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I think I have caught up with the chat. If I missed one, please speak up now. Um, Isabella. Yes, hello. Um, I I write very poor poetry, and um, so I really love the I really love the form, and um, and I too try to try to write um with the um you know feeling into um more than human space rather than just sort of p placing my perspective over the situation um and one of the things that um that i've sort of often wondered is how you think that can feed into um changing consciousness um changing human attitudes um towards towards the more than human world um, I mean, it's a shame that people don't read as much poetry as they should, I suppose. But um, any form, any art form, really, um, do you think it can play a part? Oh, yeah, I think that like my vocation is like built on the premise, like that's part of my belief system that like doing this work does matter, you know, and I strongly believe in like, you know, I talked about the the imaginative potential of poetry and like how we can inhabit those spaces that are uncertain or hard to know or more complex, you know, like, I agree with you, like, I wish more people read poetry, it, it it's, it, it's challenging, because it's not the most popular medium, but there are, um, like, I think trying to represent these in issues, and think about our impact on others whether that's other human beings non-human beings the landscape like I said like so like presenting grappling with like how we're impacting and potentially like harming the agency in the lives of that which is not us is I think like one of the essential tasks of art and poetry also so like thinking about the other and how and you know that question of being in relation like how can we best be in relation with ourselves with our loved ones with our earth with like animals pets wild animals etc like that is really like the to me the task of our time and like the work um of my poetry and I write about myself too and my own experiences but I think these things are interrelated right like like sort of developing that lens on yourself like what have you been through what is the story you're creating and telling yourself about your own life and your impact on other people and how do you um how do you feel about and incorporate the question of like what part did I play in this into your life like that's I think that's a big part of my creative work and so I, you know, I have poems about like myself my identity my childhood and then like poems about dogs in Antarctica over here they seem separate but I think like that that essential question of like being in relation trying to be better in relation especially in in this time where we're in all these all these different crises that are happening right like that nationally and globally um is the is the purpose I just um, to follow up, if you don't mind, um, you said that with those poems, it could be diff the dog poems that it could be difficult to find a you know to find a, a sort of a publishing niche um, for, for for some of that work, and I'm and I'm I'm wondering whether there might be a sort of you know an opportunity to. Um, I mean, there is more veganism, there is more um, concern about non-human animals. I wonder if there is a sort of, you know, an, an outlet for um, for um, publishing or at least publicizing artworks that engage with the more than human world. Yeah, I've just done some very fast Googling because I feel like I want to give credit to like there is at least one press that I think is really active. And they, I think they identify as a vegan press, maybe an animal activist Isn't it press. Ashling um, Creek? They're called Ashling Creek. Ashling yeah. Creek. Yeah. And so they put out this um, like a, an anthology about animal 
writing about animals. I think it's called Among Animals. They also have a, a course that they run regularly online about writing about animals, which really just like tackles these questions specifically from that human, human animal studies perspective, I think. So I would just like, and they also compile in their newsletter, I think a number of like different opportunities for um, publishing, writing about animals and nature. So I, I just want to give them a lot of, like, give them some traffic to their website. They're doing great active work. And I'm not saying they're the only one. They're definitely the one that's, like, most on my radar. Thank you. We have a comment and question from Angela that I'll read to you from the chat. Thank you for sharing all your poems. I'm a human animal studies student and love poetry, and I loved your presentation. Something I've been curious about is anthropomorphizing animals in writing. What do you think about the role of anthropomorphism? For example, I've wondered if it could possibly diminish animals' experiences as animals by centering their experiences instead around how humans think. Could anthropomorphizing also help people better empathize with the animals in your writing? Yeah, I, I um, think a lot about anthropomorphizing. Um, where I've kind of landed on it is that that anthropomorphizing is not the enemy, right? It's it's actually unavoidable. So like, how can we encounter and represent the world through our art, but through a human lens? We are human animals, right? Um, I think what's more critical is being aware of how our, like we are filtering the experiences of the other that we're tackling through our own consciousness, our own experience of the world. Um, so I, I think, yeah, it's like having some, not, I'm, I'm trying to word this well, like there's no way to, uh, to achieve like 100% objectivity or scientific objectivity on anything because we are humans we have our own experience like lived experiences and our own biases so I think it's less about pretending not to have those things and inhabiting this like distant robotic voice or whatever it may be and more about like like really interrogating the our lived experiences and how those like might impact our view of things and how we represent and understand animals um, another way I think about this in my work is like, I don't know if you all have heard about, and again, I'm not, not an expert in this topic, but the concept of umbelts, it's spelled like this, it's like a German word. Um, and so I think what that means, real quick so I can get the actual definition. Um, so yeah, so this is, it comes from the biological foundations that lie at the center of both communication and signification in the human and non-human animal. Um, so it's like translated as self-centered world. So thinking about the umwelt, the the particular world, the the world, the experience of the world and the world of that thing, which like the like a tick that might be crawling through the grass in my yard has a very, very, very different world right that it's valid that they're inhabiting from the world that i'm inhabiting right like totally different experiences sensory um stimuli like way of processing so it's i think poetry is exciting to kind of like try to like again we can't we can't ever fully know what is the experience of the umbelt the world of a tick but like we can try to through through creativity through like scientific research from those who are expert on that, um, that being like, we can try to imagine that space. Thank you. And we are coming towards the end of our time. Um, I did put in the chat our upcoming colloquiums if you wanna to come to any future colloquiums. So I wanted to give you all enough time to copy and cut and paste that if you want. We have a couple minutes left. So if anyone has one more question, that they're um, burning to ask. Now would be the time. And I shared the link. I think somebody was like, what was the name of the press? You said I shared the link to Ashland Creek Press in the chat if anybody wants to grab that. Thank you. And, and if, you're, if you are at all a writer, like um, writing poetry, interest in poetry at all, or any creative writing, like, I, like you, that makes you a writer. And I would encourage you to like keep exploring that craft and maybe participating in a workshop or a course related to writing about animals. Could you also put your email address in the chat, Caitlin, just in case someone wants to reach out to you more about your work? I saw that you put it up on your last screen, but people might not have gotten it. 
thank you so much for the work that you have been doing and for sharing your work with all of us today and hopefully inspiring some of us to um, use this type of creativity in exploring our own work or to access poetry as we think through a lot of the issues um, and the research that we might be doing in other fields. It's clear that this is something that um, we can all benefit from in the field of human animal studies. Um, thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you to everybody who came out today. We're going to have a colloquium in the first, last week of October, first week of November, I believe it's November 3rd, and that one is going to be about the role of emotional labor and humane interspecies work, and then we will have another one on December 8th to round out this semester's talks on how non-human animals campaign non-human animal companions intersect with childhood innocence in the U in U.S. mixed species families. So there's a lot of great stuff coming up, and I'm so grateful that this was the talk that got us started this semester. It started us with a lot of energy and a lot to think about. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you all.